So we all sign out, yes? No, 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 no. 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 <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll get it. We'll get it. Don't we'll get it by tomorrow. No escaping. All right. So we so now we're we are right. attendees are logging in. If you watch them now, you can see attendees coming in. Yep. No, I'll I'll just step away. So uh session. Okay, so we have, uh, we have 29 participants, so uh, we are live. Okay, you got it? It's seven. Okay, good evening all. We are back in session. Uh, again, welcome to our April 20th uh, town council meeting. Uh, this is a, a live streaming meeting. Uh, for those of you that are chiming in from home, uh, if you're on the internet uh, through one of your web browsers, there should be a button to raise your hand if you uh, would like to ask a question at the appropriate time. If you're calling in by phone, uh, you would need to hit uh, pound, no, star six in order to be able to Mute or unmute your phone. Star nine. Star nine. Star nine will raise your hand. Star nine will will raise your hands, and star six will mute and unmute your phone. Okay, just making myself. Know. Okay, all right. So, um, if we if we could begin with our uh, pledge of allegiance and a moment of silence for our men and women serving in harm's way. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States, United States of America, to the republic, republic for which, which it stands, one nation, one nation under God, indivisible, liberty, liberty and justice for all. Thank you all. <laughs> that that delay is going to get is going to mess us up. <laughs> we'll get there. We'll get there. Uh, again, thank you all. All right. Um, President's executive. Oh, you got to do the roll call first. Yep. Sorry. Let's do the roll call. Ms. Ujikusa? Present. Ms. Abbott? Present. Mr. Hamilton? Present. Mr. Katzman? Is that mute? Present. You're muted. Present. <laughs> Mr. Kelly? Present. Dr. Ryan? Here. Mr. Aguiar? Present. All present and accounted for. Thank you. Uh, the President's Executive Summary. Uh, just before the Council tonight, we did have an executive session on potential litigation, and I can report out that one vote was taken. Um, on to our consent agenda. Everybody's on mute. Mr. President, Len Katzman. I move we receive and place on file. Uh, no. Okay. Approve as submitted. I'm sorry, approve as submitted. Approve as submitted. Mr. Hamilton? Mr. Hamilton. Yes. <laughs> okay, all those in favor. Ms. Ujikusa? Aye. Ms. Abbott? Aye. Mr. Hamilton? Aye. Mr. Katzman? Aye. Mr. Kelly? Aye. Dr. Ryan? Aye. Mr. Aguiar? Aye. Motion passes 7 to 0. Next, we have 
our minutes from our April 6th town council meeting. Move to accept as presented. Second. Okay, thank you. All those in favor of that? Mr. Hamilton was a second. Yep, Mr. Hamilton was a second. Oh, sorry, I gotta say it. <laughs> Ms. Ujifusa? Aye. Ms. Abbott? Aye. Mr. Hamilton? Aye. Mr. Katzman? Aye. Mr. Kelly? Aye. Dr. Ryan? Aye. Mr. Aguilar? Aye. All right, on to our town administrator's report. Good evening, Mr. President, uh, ladies and gentlemen of the council, ladies and gentlemen listening in. Uh, in May, the town will uh, seek nominations for the annual enforcement award. This award is presented annually to individuals, uh, businesses, or civic groups of enforcement who have consistently demonstrated excellence in community leadership, producing significant results directly, uh, directly benefiting the community uh, and our citizens. A press release will be issued this week and information will be made available on our website. Uh, nominations will be due May 29th, Friday, May 29th. With respect to uh, the ongoing pandemic, I wanna say thank you to all our residents, the businesses and community partners. I know the current measures we live under are having a significant impact on our quality of life. I wanna thank you for staying home, for limiting social interaction, for washing your hands, and using face coverings in public. Rhode Island is doing far better than earlier models had predicted. However, we are still in between two major hotspots, which means it is increasingly important that we continue to follow stay-at-home orders and other health directives. We all have uh, a part to play in slowing the spread. I will again remind residents and visitors to keep our first responders and healthcare workers in mind. Every time you put your own health at risk, you're putting their health at risk. I am aware that there's a ton of information being distributed every day, and I know it can be difficult to keep up. We are trying to help. Please visit our website where we post current and important information relevant to enforcement. There you will find information and links to guide you if you are feeling sick, if you need more information on keeping each other safe, if you are unemployed or have been laid off, if you need assistance or want a lending hand, or if you are going through a mental health or substance abuse crisis and you, or you know someone who is, or if you are a business or a nonprofit looking for help. If the answer is not there, call <laughs> or email us at the Portsmouth Emergency Operations Center. <coughs> Thank you for your support and cooperation during this un unprecedented time. I'd like to specifically address the Portsmouth Food Bank tonight. The Portsmouth Community Emergency Food Bank began operation on March 30th. It's a concerted effort to serve the needs of our residents during this crisis and provide food for many households from the donations of generous people and organizations. To date, we have had 353 visits to the food bank. The number of daily visits has been steadily increasing. 91 families visited the food bank last Thursday alone. The food bank is open Wednesday, Monday, Wednesday and Friday from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. for food distribution and is available only to residents of Portsmouth. Food Bank is in the parish hall of St. Bernard's Church on East Main Road. Portsmouth residents may come to the lower rear parking lot of St. Bernard's Church and follow the signs. A Food Bank volunteer will come out to your car to assist you, so you don't have to park and you don't have to get out of your car. If you need assistance, call ahead and we'll make arrangements to help you. For those unable to come to the food bank personally or need other assistance or have special circumstances, we ask you to call us or email portsmouth.foodbank at gmail.com to make alternate arrangements. Non-perishable and non-expired food donations are urgently needed. Donations can be dropped off anytime between 8.30 in the morning and 2 p.m. in the afternoon on Monday, Wednesday, and or Friday. Bring your donation to the parish hall at the lower parking lot and a volunteer will come out to your car and retrieve it. The generous support for, of all has been overwhelming so far. Specifically, the items needed include cereal, pancake mix, syrup, macaroni and cheese, peanut butter, jelly, powdered milk, baked beans, canned fruit, pasta, pasta sauce, 
canned vegetables, canned fruit, canned tuna or chicken, crackers, rice in packages, canned soups, coffee, tea, or hot chocolate, and similar type of items. We are also seeking monetary donations. There are multiple ways to do this, and they are listed on our website. If you write a check, please make them payable to the town of Portsmouth and note food bank on the, on the front of the check. Checks will be hand can be hand-delivered to the food bank or mailed to Community Food Bank at the Portsmouth Town Hall using the Portsmouth Town Hall address. All money donated is placed into a special fund account and will be used for the purchase of food to donate. All this information is available in the Portsmouth specific Corona information section of our website. If you go to our website, you will see at the top banner a COVID-19 link that says read on. Click on that link and at the left side of that page, you will see a link that takes you to the uh, food bank or you can scroll down in that page and you will see under uh, social welfare uh, all this information laid out uh, it, under the, the title food bank. So again, thank you for your support and cooperation during this unprecedented time. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. Randy. Okay. Next item, we have uh, old business. Uh, it's our monthly finance report. Uh, Ms. Mills. Lisa, is your speaker working? Okay, Lisa's speaker isn't working. I can see that she's on. Um, with respect to this uh, monthly report, uh, we are at 75% of the current fiscal year. Our overall revenues are currently at 76%. That is slightly ahead of where we are in this year, but at the same point as last year. Expenditures are at 71%, lower than the 75% where we are in the year, and also the same as last year's. Uh, there is no significant wire for a clearinghouse transit. Clearinghouse transfers to report. Thank you, Mr. Raymond. Okay. Mr. President? Yes. The, the motion to receive and place on file. Second. <laughs> Mr. Hamilton. So, Mr. Hamilton has the motion. I need a second. Seconded. Seconded by Dr. Ryan. All those in favor? Ms. Ujikusa? Aye. Ms. Abbott? Aye. Mr. Hamilton? Aye. Mr. Katzman? Aye. Mr. Kelly? Mr. Kelly? He's muted. He's muted. Aye. <laughs> Dr. Ryan? Aye. Mr. Aguirre? Aye. Motion passes seven to zero. Thank you all. Okay, on to new business. Uh, it's a presentation of the uh, FY19 audit, and we have uh, Carol Elise. Please, yes. Okay. So I just wanted to make a statement before we get started. Um, for those of you that are, are in the audience, um, we're, we're going to go through the audit. So please uh, hold questions until after the presentation, and then we'll take questions uh, after the presentation. Perfect. Thank you. Good evening to the counselors, the members of management, and the citizens of the town of Portsmouth. Um, thank you for having us here during this unprecedented time. My name is Carol Lees, and I represent the firm Hague Sahadi out of Fall River, Massachusetts. Uh, we are proud to present the audit results for the year. The year ended June 30th, 2019. Before we get started, we'll just keep uh, the screen on the cover page. Um, I would like to first provide an overview of what is called the Comprehensive Annual Financial Report. Um, and that is called CAFR for short. So if you hear me refer to CAFR, I'm referring to the Comprehensive Annual Financial Report. We will discuss and describe what makes CAFR different than a traditional financial statement. A CAFR contains sections beyond the traditional financial statement. And it's a financial document that takes an extraordinary effort. The Comprehensive Annual Financial Report uh, contains an introductory section, as well as statistical sections. Those are beyond 
what you would see in a traditional financial statement. The CAFR is optional, and it is once it is prepared, it, it is submitted to the Government Finance Officers Association, where it is considered for a certificate of excellence. There are only about 4,000 governmental organizations nationwide that makes this achievement. The introductory section, which is the first section that you would see in the CAFR, includes a letter of transmittal, the organization chart, a list of council and school committee members, and it really describes the overall tone for the organization. The financial section, which is the section of the CAFR for which everyone uh, is used to seeing on a traditional financial statement, includes six sections. The management discussion and analysis, the government-wide financial statements, the fund financial statements, the footnotes to the financial statements, required supplementary information, and supplementary information. I will just quickly describe each section for you before we get into the actual figures for the current year. So the management discussion and analysis, otherwise called the MDNA, provides a layman's approach and a high level overview of the statements. This section describes key financial highlights and the overview of the financial statements, high-level comparisons or analytics to the prior year data, highlights of debt, capital assets, and economic factors, as well as the effects of next year's budget. The next section, the government-wide financial statements, presents the entire go government's financial results on the accrual basis of accounting except that it excludes fiduciary fund activities because funds like pension and OPEB trusts do not benefit the government itself and instead benefits the individuals in these plans. Then we have our fund financial statement, which includes the first part would be your governmental funds. Then you would have your enterprise funds and fiduciary funds. The governmental funds is where you would see the activity of your town's general fund, the school unrestricted fund, and other governmental funds. The enterprise funds include your transfer station and school lunch funds, among other funds. And your fiduciary funds include funds held to benefit others, like your pension, OPEB, and agency funds. Then we have your footnotes to your financial statements, which present in greater detail a description of the items presented in your financial statement. It also details policy and policies and other items for the town. An example of a policy is how many years the town appreciates vehicles, for example, and the threshold for a vehicle becoming an asset. You will also see details on cash, investment, capital assets, and debt. You would see in the footnotes that the majority of the footnotes are really to describe the pension and the OPEB plan. Then we have the required supplementary schedule. Uh, they would present things like the budget and actual comparison for your general fund, and other required schedules for your pension and OPEB plan. And the last section of the financial section of the CAFR are the supplementary schedules. Schedules that are not required by governmental accounting standards, but are shown because they are either useful to the readers, or they may be required or requested by the state of Rhode Island's Auditor General. For example, the Auditor General requires the combined fund schedules and the property tax schedules that are presented in your supplemental section. And the very last section of the CAFR is the statistical section. Okay, so now we are going to start with the actual current year presentation. Um, if we go to the next page, that you'll see at the top is the independent auditor's report. And if we go to the second page of the independent auditor's report, uh, which is, yep, so the opinion paragraph at the top of that page, which is page number 13, um, you will see 
um, that the opinion is fairly stated in all material respects. It is considered a clean opinion. It is what is referred to as an unmodified report. So congratulations to the town of Portsmouth for, for achieving a clean audit. If we can go to the next page, please. Okay, so this document is um, towards the end of the CAFR, uh, pages 180 and 181. This is called the Yellow Book Report on Internal Controls. Because the town is a government, they are required to follow governmental auditing standards. Um, under these standards, we would have to report on any instances of non-compliance of laws or regulations. And we will see um, throughout this report, but really towards the bottom of this page here, um, that during this audit, we did not find any instances of material weaknesses or significant deficiencies over internal controls over financial reporting. And on the next page, we did not indicate any items of non-compliance or other matters. So that's more great news. Okay, so if we move to the next page, please. Now we will start presenting the actual financial results. Um, so we would see on this page, 28 of the audit, 28 of the audit um, towards the bottom, if we look at the net position, we will see the government-wide financial statements did present a deficit in the net position of $51.8 million, where most of that really was with the governmental activity. Um, and I'll get into the details of why, um, but really it has to do with your OPEB and your pension liabilities. Um, if we look at the liabilities up in the next section here, um, we would see, I think we just need to go back to page 28, sorry, um, the liability, yes. So we would see that the pension and the OPEB liabilities, um, the OPEB liability was 20.9 million and the net pension liability was 78 million, totaling 98.9 million dollars combined. So although the government wide has a deficit of 51.8 million, it's really due to these pension and OPEB liabilities. You'll also see under business type activities that there is a small um, positive net position of $23,000, $230,000, I'm sorry. And page 38, the next page, uh, we would see that the majority of that was a school cafeteria fund of $230,000 followed by 76,000 for the septic system loan program. Now, I think we move to page 30. Um, okay, so page 30 shows um, that for government-wide, there's a decrease uh, in net position, it's a change in net position, which is towards the bottom of the page, page 30. Yeah, to the bottom of 30. Yes, the change in that position, which is the third line from the bottom. Um, we would see that there was a decrease in that position of 127,000 in total, which was made up of yes. 135,000 for business type activities and negative 262,000 for governmental activities. Really, both of these uh, categories realizes, realize increases and decreases that were insignificant to the beginning net position as a whole. Um, and I believe the next page is a repeat of page 38. Yes, and so if we go to the very bottom, please, we would see that the change in net position um, for each one of those proprietary funds um, were positive, and really that each fund had an insignificant amount for each activity individually. Um, the next page, please. I think might be page 33. Okay. Um, on this page, we would see that governmental fund ending fund balance in the total column all the way over presented was $12.3 million. 
a decrease of $5.6 million for the current year. And that is primarily due to capital outlay costs of $7.7 .7 million for the town's capital project fund. This decrease was mainly due to expenditures of the new police station of $6.2 million. And the general fund, the total, out of the total presented, $8.3 million. If, we, if you were to look back to page 31, we can keep it on this page, but if you were to look at page 31, you would see the unassigned fund balance for the general fund is $8.3 million. And that's the amount of the fund balance that's not designated or restricted to be used for a specific purpose. So we can also see on page 33 that the general fund has a current year operating surplus of $923,000 for fiscal year 2019. And now if we move to the next page, which I think is page 115, yeah. Um, that is the general fund's budget and budget versus actual statement. We would see that revenues received were in excess of the budget by 500, 520,000. Revenues were up 337,000 for collections on prior year taxes due to the timing of collections coming in sooner than originally anticipated or budgeted. And 265,000 more collected in fees and licenses. And that was due to um, a few different types of fees and licenses that just happened to come in more than budget. One was the clerk's office real estate transfers coming in by 107,000 more than collect, uh, budgeted originally. There were also savings and expenditures of 645,000. I think if we just scroll down slightly, thank you. Compared to the budget in the following areas. Public works had a savings of 300,000, police 140,000, and human resources of 166,000. And if we move to page 136, towards the bottom of that page, you'll see, I believe, three lines up that the school unrestricted fund ended the year with a $60,000 deficit. Page, this uh, page shows an operating surplus of 484,000. Um, however, there were 537,000 of unbudgeted transfers to the school capital fund, which created the $60,000 deficit in the school and restricted funds overall. And if we could please move to page 25, the total column for the capital asset, all the way to the right, uh, shows a total of the um, $49.8 million versus $44 million for the prior year. Um, that is an increase of capital assets of $5.8 million, net of the current year depreciation expense. And really the majority of that related to the police station project. And if we scroll down a little, we'll see there's a section for debt um, on that page. And the debt decreased by approximately $2 million from $25.6 million to $23.6 million. And if you wanted further details on that note, you would look at pages 72 through 74. You would find a breakout of the long-term debt. The next page is 41. So pages 41 and the next page after 42 really shows uh, the fiduciary funds. You'll see a column. Um, for the Employee Benefit Trust Fund. And that's really a comp combined column for the OPEB and the Pension Trust Fund. If you wanted to see the detail of the OPEB and the Trust Fund, the Pension Trust, you would go to pages 166 and 167, which are following these pages here. So if we could just scroll through, please. So that first column that you're seeing there, uh, if you scroll down, um, you'll see that that is further broken out onto pages 166 and 167. Yes, these pages here. And if we can move to page 125, which follows this one here, the town pension trust fund has a net plan fiduciary position, uh, which is the second line, I believe, on that schedule of 57.3 million which has grown since 2014 of $46.8 million. 
Um, the pension plan is about 55.15% funded. It has increased since 2016, but has dropped slightly the last two years. And if we looked at page 127, which I believe might be following this one, um, and I apologize if I didn't put it up, but you can refer to page 127. It would show you a lower average rate of investment return than in the last two years. Um, there were no major assumption changes. Uh, the discount rate was the same as the prior year at 6.75%. And if we look at page 126, which I believe is the next page there, we'll see um, in the column of 2019 that the town made the actuarially determined contribution of $4.3 million. Um, if we move to page 129, which would be the OPEB plan, we'll see a net position of $1.5 million, grown substantially since 2017, where it was $1.1 million. And you can see the trend on that page. The OPEB plan is 7.53% funded. It has increased since 2017, where it was 5.10%. The discount rate was slightly dropped. Um, it was 4.03% last year. This year, it's 3.78%. And if we move to the next, I think it might be page 62. Yeah. Um, if you can go down just a little further, please. Thank you. So the section that says accounting pronouncements implemented in the current year. This, just, this is one of the footnotes that shows um, the town um, the, that we implemented GASI 88 with management this year. It relates to um, enhancing the disclosures on your debt. Um, it required the town to identify debt that was acquired through public sale or borrowed directly through a financial institution. Um, so you would see that this footnote um, impacts note number seven, long-term obligations you would see that it looks and feels differently than, than last year. And also on the next page, 63, um, this describes accounting pronouncements that will be applicable in future years. Uh, the impact from these standards will be evaluated by management in concert with working with the auditors. One thing to note here is due to COVID-19, the GASB is in the process of determining if they will extend the standards to a later date. Um, if we could please move to the next page. Uh, page 90. So um, this also shows a change um, in the presentation. This note actually shows uh, what's called the aggregate. It takes the two different OPEB plans, the town and the school plan, and it shows the reader's key information and it aggregates into a total. So this is a new, a new section of a footnote compared to last year. And if we move to the next page, note 12, page 111, this does the same thing. If you scroll down a little more, thank you. You'll see that each pension plan is separated um, and it aggregates the data. Um, so if you wanted to see high level data, you want to see what you know the OPEB and the pension, you could go to the very end of those footnotes um, to see a breakout of each, each plan. And that really summarizes the key changes to the statements for the current year. Um, that's the end of our slides, but I just wanted to note a few other observations. So we are responsible for communicating significant matters related to the audit uh, that are not professional judgment are relevant to your oversight responsibilities in the financial reporting process. So just a few things to note here. There were no significant changes in accounting policies from the prior year. There were no significant or unusual transactions noted. No instances of fraud or illegal acts were noted. No reportable management letter comments. We had no changes to our plan scope of the audit. Um, and we did look at areas um, that required estimates. Um, we, we heavily looked at pension and OPEB amounts. We compared um, the valuation methodologies to those used in the prior years. 
We looked to see if the actuaries utilized had a good reputation. And we performed analytics um, over the pension and the OPEP data. We also looked at the census and we performed census testing. Um, we had no disagreements with management. Um, we, we did not uh, know any difficulties encountered during the audit. And um, that really, oh, the only other thing I would like to add is that we did perform the federal compliance audit, which is a separate report. And that had a clean report as well. Uh, it was an unmodified report. We reviewed the special education program this year, um, and all went very well. <laughs> thank you, Karen. Thank you. Uh, and, and thank you for everyone who was at home following following that. Um, we will open it up to questions, um, comments from. Uh, do have any of the counselors have any questions or comments regarding the audit? And again, just to remind folks, um, if you're if you're online, you have the ability to hit the raise hand. Uh, if you're calling in on your phone, I see there are several phone numbers. Um, start no star nine star nine to raise your hand, uh, and star six to mute and unmute your phone. I do ask that if you are calling in, um, either way with a question, please provide your name and address. Uh, for the clerk. Um, if we are not able to answer your question, uh, we will take down your question and make sure that we get you uh, an appropriate response. So uh, if there are no comments from counselors, questions, um, just I'm just looking down the list to see if there's any folks in attendance. I do not see any. Um, Questions? So, any anybody raising their hand? <laughs> uh, we do have a. Did you did you see a hand come up? Okay, so how do we pick on that person? <laughs> and I don't mean that in a bad way. Just okay. Uh, just hi. C can you hear me? We can. Okay, this is Tom Grieve. No pilot error this time. Tom um, Green, 110 Thayer Drive. Thank you. Um, I have three um, questions uh, that I did not understand in the audit. Well, it, you know, three that I thought were important to, to ask it about. Uh, let me start with page 33. Um, that's the statement of the changes in the fund balance. If you follow the general fund column to the bottom, you see the nice $922,000 uh, surplus that we had. Congratulations, I hope we hear how that happened. But that surplus is added to the previous year fund balance to get this year's ending fund balance. The only problem I saw was that the July 1st, 2018 balance shown is $7.7 .7 million when the June 30th, 2018 general fund balance in the previous audit, previous audit was 9.2 million. I saw no explanation of this in the audit and the description of the general fund on page 48 is exactly the same as in the 2018 audit. Can someone help me out on this? Yes. So the school unrestricted fund was previously combined with the general fund, um, but it's really best practice um, for that school unrestricted fund to be shown separately as a major special revenue fund. Oh. You would not okay. Have seen um, 2018, you would not have seen that being a separate fund, uh, but really it was combined with the general fund. Okay, but why would then, if, if that's the case, why wasn't that footnoted or somehow disclosed? Uh, general accounting principles say that, uh, you, you know, consistency 
unless you footnote it, uh, because we try to compare um, between different periods. I believe it should, uh, it should be footnoted somewhere as a reclassification, um, because well, that's really what it was. It was a reclassification um, under GASB 54. The school unrestricted fund is really meets the definition of a special revenue fund. So okay, I can I can under, I can understand that. I can't understand why why the uh, uh, the the um, it, it it wasn't footnoted or highlighted somehow so people could understand uh, that there was that change. I believe it should have been okay. footnoted. Um, it may not have a separate footnote because the total governmental funds did not change as a whole. Um, it was just that it was separated. So is that something okay. um, um, just clarify with and just so we can make sure we get the proper response. Um, yep. It's just a sounds like it's just a, it's a technicality, a technicality for, for, for noting. Well, it, okay. it should be referenced. Mr. President, it may be a technicality, but general fund is, a, is the name of the fund that has not changed. Correct. The definition of general fund on the next page, page 34, has not changed. That's correct. But the, the amount in the fund did change. That, is, to me, that, that's a, a, a major problem in an audit. That's correct. If it's, it's not actually, footnoted. It was actually a comment for the prior year comprehensive annual financial report from the GFOA um, that it should have been separated because it wasn't reconciled appropriately in 2018 to the budget and actual statements, and now it is. Now each fund individually, individually would reconcile to the budget and actual statements presented. And, and you don't think that should be footnoted? I didn't say that. I did. I did say that it. Should be <laughs> I didn't think so. There. Okay. Uh, let me get on to the next one. You've explained it. I understand it. Okay. My, my second problem starts with the same schedule, page 33. If you go to the bottom line under the town capital project fund column, you will see that the June 30th, 2019 balance was $884,000. Got that? Yes, the ending fund balance is okay. 2019. Okay. Now, if you go to page 139, the same town capital project fund is shown with a June 30th, 2019 balance. That's the same day. And it shows the balance as a negative 1.4 million. Right. So if that is a. Page 139 is the summary of the non-major fund, not the town capital project fund that is a major fund. There are multiple capital project funds. It happens to be that the town capital project fund that ends with 884,000 is a major fund of page 33. If you go to the non-major governmental fund column, that ends with 1,393,999. That reconciles to page 139. And that town capital project fund column represents ending in negative 1,410,328 is comprised of several other capital project funds. It does not include. Okay. Yes. Again, again, that may be the explanation. But yes. you have here a fund that is named exactly the same thing in both columns. Yes. We, we did use the name on town record. Um, you know, maybe we could discuss with the town if there is a different appropriate naming convention for, for a following year. But do, you, do you understand, do you understand that, the, that this audit is for the, the, the people at home as well, how are we supposed to understand when you label things identical and they're and you're telling me they're different, but there's nothing in the audit that says they're different? Um, so if you look at the top of page 139, it says combining non-major governmental funds. 
And if you look back at page 33, there's a column that says non-major governmental funds. And the column for town capital is under major okay. funds. So it's okay, but the the, the, the yeah. names are the same. I understand. But we did use a name. Okay, all right. Well, well, well let's 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 Let's, a, let's, let's, let's dispense with that one. Um, my, my last one, my last question is on page 159, and it's back to our old friend, the, the 1213 warrants. The liability has increased this audit year by another $500,000 and is now $1.8 million. Yeah, so all I, don't remember, yeah. I don't remember any authorization by the town council to increase the liability, nor do I understand what the money was used for. Can you help me on that? So I can tell you that the expenditures that were charged to the fund in 2019 were for 180,000 for the Portsmouth Middle School switchboard and electrical costs, and 178,000 for Hathaway School Windows replacement project. And that's where it was charged that to that fund by the management of um, the town. Um, so I unfortunately I'd have to ask. Um, if the town feels that that would be appropriate fund, but I do know that the town is looking at the deficits in those funds, and they do have an administrative plan to fund that. But but the the the, the thing that you I should understand is that the town council has to authorize that, and I go most go to most town council meetings, and I can never remember that. I would love to see the minutes in which it was authorized. Oh, that that original fund, that original warrant fund was a school fund that the town never put the money into. So the, the, the money was borrowed and then it was put into a road program. It was never funded. It's been carried since 2012. So those projects still have to get charged to that line item, which is that warrant. And as I stated a couple years ago when I did this study, uh, it's about a $2 million deficit. Okay. So uh, can we, are, are we to expect uh, those to go up again next year? I, I'd have to talk to the school and see if they completed those projects. I believe they are, but I'll, I can get back to them. Sure, that's something we can, we can keep an eye on. Yeah. And, and we, we are aware of it. And it does go back to that warrant issue from a couple of years ago, Correct. which you've identified. Okay. All right. I, I, appreci I appreciate the, the answers. Uh, I, I hope uh, you at least take some of the uh, uh, comments that I made uh, because I don't think this audit was very clear uh, on some of these things at all. So, uh, and again, it's a clean audit. That's great. But we've got to make it so people can understand what uh, is going on uh, by the audit. That's the purpose of it. And it would seem to be in 199 pages, we ought to be able to make it clear. Thank you very much. I appreciate the uh, the, the chance to talk. And uh, again, uh, this is seems to be working fine. Appreciate it. Thank, thank, thank you. Mr. you. So it seems like some of those issues are just our own naming funds, and, and maybe we get or we can, yeah, yeah, we can we can we can address those type of housekeeping measures. I mean, if, you know that we had answers. We know where the money is. Uh, we know what the funds are, but but the confusion could be too, you know, government. I understand that. Something like that. Um, I'm just looking to see if there are any other. I don't see any other hands. Um, are there any comments, questions from our counselors? Ms. Ujibuza? I just wanted to clarify um, with our um, auditors. You said that only 4,000 entities get the certificate of excellence. Is that in the? Yes, and so that might have been based on the issuances of the 2018 CAPRs or maybe even 2017 CAPRs. Um, but I did look at the GFOA website, and I believe it was around 4,300 um, nationwide. So every governmental entity in the United States has the opportunity to apply for a CAPR. Um, you know, I don't know really how many apply. Um, 
I am a volunteer reviewer for the GFOA. I can tell you personally that not every entity that applies gets a certificate of excellence. Um, so it's a very, um, it's, it's, it's a pride point that the town should have on their statement. I believe this would be the fourth year um, that the town um, may be able to get the award. Um, and I'm confident that they'll be awarded uh, the certificate of excellence. All right. I just want to thank the staff for doing this unbelievable job and putting us in the position of getting that excellence award for the last few years. We really appreciate all your hard work. Thank you. From our council. Okay. That was an excellent uh, presentation. Um, I think we were able to hit all the highlights. Uh, I was able to follow through. I mean, I had to cheat. I had to cheat sheets here, um, but it, it was very helpful. I thought uh, we were able to identify stuff, and um, and I'm sure if we, you know, uh, those questions uh, to get to get those things as we continue to evolve the process. We'll, we'll, every year we seem to tweak it a little bit. Every year it gets a little better. So absolutely, it was uh, excellent work. And same thing with the department heads, Mr. Rainer, Ms. Mills, um, for you know, getting to all the information. Thank you. And it was a joy to work with management. Managers, so thank you. Could you say that again? <laughs> <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so do we need a... Uh... I believe we already received it, Mr. President, in the file when we first accepted it. Okay. All right. So thank you. All right. We are all set. Thank you very much. Just give us a moment to, to switch seats. <laughs> okay, we're on to New business number two, uh, it's a request approval for a road opening permit to complete a new gas line installation at 54 Lisa Terrace. Uh, do we have someone from National Grid or is this Woodhead? Council President, members of the council is Brian Woodhead, Public Works. Gotcha. I got Jack Alfonso here uh, in my office. Uh, to answer any questions that you may have. Uh, this is before you because the ordinance, our street ordinance, our street ordinance states that the director of public works uh, cannot approve any, let me see, no approval of the director of public works for 10 years. So if they want to appeal it, they have to ask the council approval. So I have Jacques here, he wanted to uh, appeal the, my approval. So here you go. Okay, hold on one second. Oh, I apologize for that. Can you hear me now? We got you. All right, great. Um, thank you, Brian, and thank you, Council, for your time today. As uh, Brian mentioned, my name is Jacques Afonso. I'm the National Grid Community Customer Manager. Uh, I'm the Account Manager Liaison for the Municipality, the Town of Portsmouth. Um, so I'm here today to request the approval for the road opening permit for National Grid to complete the gas, uh, the gas service installation for 54 Lisa Terrace in Portsmouth. Um, the, we, National Grid received a request, uh, the new uh, gas service request for 54 Lisa Terrace in June of 2019. Uh, from there, the process initiated with, between the customer and the gas sales rep. Um, unfortunately, um, towards the end, the agreement was, uh, was executed, but the payment was made by the customer, but the gas sales rep was not aware that the payment was made and was processed. Um, and unfortunately, the, um, this area was paved, I believe it was the, in August, the end of the summer of 2019. So unfortunately, National Grid missed the opportunity to install before this area was paved. Uh, fast forward into late fall, National Grid um, noticed that the payment was made, um, contacted the customer, and there was still a request for the gas service. 
Um, so National Grid did uh, f um, pretty much proceed to um, initiate a permit request, which was denied as a, appropriately because it was a, a newly paved road. Um, and this was in January of 2020, if I'm not mistaken, um, which then in, uh, I believe in, in the February, March, I spoke to uh, Brian to kind of review what the process would be to see if this uh, approval would be, uh, would be permitted. Um, and, um, and here we are today. Um, before the application was put in to attend the town council to get on the agenda, our, uh, our construction supervisor, uh, Phil DeMello, did meet with Brian to review the, um, the service and what it would take to get it installed. Um, I believe as part of the, the agenda item, there is a PDF that shows uh, an image of Michael Terrace and, um, and uh, I'm sorry, Lisa Terrace and Michael Drive. Um, and in that picture, that blue box, that pretty much uh, indicates the end of the gas main going down Michael, uh, Michael Drive. Uh, to be able to connect this uh, new service with 54 Lisa Terrace, uh, we would require a 3 by 8 an approximate 3 by 8 opening, that's that blue box. From there, we would install a new gas main um, on the shoulder, away from the road, um, further down Michael Drive, and then into Lisa Terrace, and then we would directional install, directionally install um, into the property 54 Lisa Terrace. So what we're requiring is uh, the opening, that blue box on Michael Drive, approximately 3 by 8 um, our supervisor did review uh, with, uh, with Brian, Mr. Mr. Woodhead, the requirements for the restoration, um, and we would comply um, per those requirements if the uh, permit is approved. And I will answer any questions that I, I can. Mr. President, this is uh, Keith Hamilton. Hamilton? Uh, Jacques, my, my main concern is there's a lot of these cuts that we have throughout town and once the repair is done and National Grid, the water company, whoever it is, disappears and it, it's, they go away in a year or two is when you really start to see the damage to reshow. Uh, there's settling or uh, there's cracking because of frost heaves or whatever. What is your commitment to coming back and repairing this if after a year or so there is more damage or it's the repair wasn't done, uh, I guess to a full extent to make it a permanent repair? We, we would own this, um, this patch here, we would own for 10 years. Okay. So if it, if it were to settle, if it would, uh, something would recur, um, all we would take is Brian or somebody from, uh, Mr. I apologize, Mr. Woodhead, somebody from the DPW office or the municipality to contact National Grid and we'd go out there and, uh, and make repairs. Okay. And you're confident that you're going to be able to do the, uh, the torpedo underneath the ground to make the uh, connection to the other side? Um, based on the conversation I've had with the supervisor and the review in the field, um, he was confident that that is possible. Okay. So you're not going to come back to us uh, in an emergency status and asking us to trench that portion? If, um, if, if that were to happen, I wouldn't be alone. I'd have the supervisor with me to explain what happened and why that was not possible. Okay. I, I, presume, I presume your ownership of the blue patch also extends to the tunneled section of Lisa Terrace. If that started to subside, show erosion, would you be repairing that as well? Correct. Okay. Mr. President, this is Keith Hamilton. I'd make a motion that we approve uh, National Grid's request. Second. Second by Lynn Cash. So we have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Ms. Ujikusa? Aye. Ms. Abbott? Aye. Mr. Hamilton? Aye. Mr. Kelly? I'm sorry, Mr. Katzman? Aye. Mr. Kelly? Aye. Dr. Ryan? Aye. Mr. Aguiar? Aye. The motion passes seven to zero. You're all set. Thank you. There's no, I should have checked. There were no other hands, right? Okay. Uh, on to new business number three. It's a presentation and submission for review of the town administrator's proposed budget for fiscal year beginning July 1, 2020 to June 30th, 2021. Uh, Mr. Rand. Oh, I'll just give uh, the folks here a second to bring it up on screen. <coughs> There's, yeah, okay. 
Behind all those, uh, in the lower right hand corner, you should be able to bring it up in the full screen. If it gets behind that little box there, right to where your cursor is, think that you can move that box. And you'll see like a little movie screen. Hang in there, folks. We'll be we'll be back in a second here. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, uh, tonight, I'll just uh, tonight is just an overview of the proposed budget. And as uh, everybody knows, we will get into revenues and expenditures starting tomorrow night. So, if we can go to the next slide, please. Uh, here we have the budget calendar uh, and what's remaining of it. We've scheduled Thursday night of this week as a placeholder, just as we have in years previous. Uh, we anticipate the council will adopt a provisional budget on May 11th, and the public uh, budget hearing is scheduled for June 10th at a site to be determined, uh, and the adoption of the final budget is scheduled for the June 22nd uh, town council uh, meeting agenda. Thank you. Next slide. I'm very pleased to present for your review and consideration the proposed town administrator municipal budget for fiscal year 2020 to 2021 in accordance with the applicable sections of our town chart. School and town staff have been working together since late last summer to provide a budget that will help guide you in your policy decision making process and serve to inform residents on the town's fiscal programs and operations. The construction of this budget is based on conservative financial values for both revenues and expenditures. A balanced budget considers available resources, determines their priority, and then develops a spending plan which addresses priorities within the constraints of resources available. This proposed budget is balanced and supports a municipal government focused on providing core services aligned with the town's vision and goals. Next slide, please. Are we, are all, is, is the complete slide up? I just want to make sure to, uh, is that, is that everything? Is that, yeah, yeah. That's, that's everything. Yeah. Yes, Kevin, we can see it all. Uh, actually, can I, we're seeing the presenter's view, not the actual slideshow. It would be better to see the actual, just the slides, not the presenter's view. I, I think you might have to just Why switch. Don't we pause a second and they can bring that up. So why don't we exit out of the PowerPoint and bring up the uh, PDF. There you go. Swap, there you go. Much better. Thank you. Okay. Yes, thank you. So uh, with respect to the budget takeaways, uh, the commitment of the staff remains focused on maintaining the high level of services expected by our community. Based on revenue projections and recommendation, recommended revisions to expenses, I propose expenditures of $66,726,409 from the general fund, which represents a total budget increase of 2.85% over last year and an in, in, in anticipated uh, $1.40 tax rate decrease from $16.04.04 uh, last year to $15.004 this year per thousand. The previous six month inflation rate is 2.08%. If we factor in the reduction in state aid and increase in civic support for this year, uh, this uh, proposed budget, uh, this budget is within 0.35% of the inflation rate. Our balanced budget serves to provide services to residents they cannot provide for themselves and includes funding to maintain buildings, equipment, and infrastructure. This budget supports funding for prioritized capital improvements, projects, and street paving. It also provides funding for one seasonal employee, delayed hiring for an empty clerk position, a custodian for the police station, debt service, pensions, OPEB, the Prudence Island Volunteer Fire Department, and the Prudence Island School Foundation. Contracts with public works and police unions are ongoing and anticipated changes are incorporated in this budget proposal. 
Next slide, please. So the budget drivers. Significant drivers behind this budget include a drop in state aid, increase in civic support, keeping the budget increase as close to inflation as possible, increasing the road paving budget by $125,000, and increasing funding for the, Pro the Prudence Island Volunteer Fire Department and Prudence Island School Foundation. Additionally, since the adoption of the proposed school department budget by the school committee, the economic impact of the pandemic has forced us to reevaluate all expenditures. I am recommending the town council approve the school appropriation request, but with reduced school capital funding that we'll discuss tomorrow. I have discussed this with the school superintendent and the finance director and the school department. Next slide, please. As you recall from earlier in the year when we had our road surface rating and paving discussion, our road surface rating is currently 73.12, which is slightly higher than the anticipated rating we expected when you approved $700,000 for road paving last year. By national standards, road, uh, roads enforcement are satisfactory. This chart indicates a further increase to 73.31 if we put $825,000 into the roads next year. Next slide, please. With respect to debt service, as we know, fiscal year 19 was the high watermark for the town's debt service. Bond debt service will decrease next year by $56,000. Overall, we've seen a $320,000 reduction in debt serve, bond debt service over the last two years. Next slide. However, this is offset by reductions in state aid. State aid has decreased from fiscal year 17 to fiscal year 21 by over $1.5 million. The reduction over the last two years has been $452,000. Right. As we all know, taxes are the property taxes are the largest source of revenue for our town. Taxes have traditionally accounted for up to 85% of our revenues. For this budget, they account for 86%. Same as last year. Real estate is assessed at 100% of value based on periodic reevaluations performed by the tax assessor. Our last revaluation, which is required every nine years, was conducted in 2016 17. However, a statistical revaluation, which is required every three years, was just completed this year. Thank you. Here we see an expenditure slide. Uh, I'm sorry. Um, we can see where the, rev the expenditures or where our revenues will be applied. But what should jump out is, and it's not a detriment, but it's, it's just where we focus our priorities in this town, that school and public safety account for almost 80% of our total budget. Next slide, please. As briefed tonight and reported in the CAFR, uh, we have about a $923,000 surplus. This would normally be swept into the fund balance, commonly known as the rainy day fund. In this pandemic, for many communities, it's raining. Portsmouth relies predominantly on, on property taxes to support town services. This is a relatively stable revenue source, which is not normally as sensitive to negative economic outliers as other revenue streams. We have been prudent in the development of this budget, but it is possible and even probable that some revenue streams will be affected by the ongoing crisis. I am proposing use of the fiscal year 19 surplus to establish an emergency fund that the town can draw, draw upon to mitigate possible COVID impacts on our revenues during the next fiscal year. This will prevent whipsaw effects the crisis may have to our budget while preserving the existing fund balance and also preclude us having to come to the town council uh, for either uh, a levy increase or uh, constant reallocation of funds between departments. Additionally, there is a bit of a bow wave to overcome with respect to capital needs. I propose using the surplus to pr procure needed equipment, affect necess necessary repairs, and execute important programs which would likely be deferred if not approved. My proposal will still leave over $110,000 to be added to the town's fund balance. 
Next slide, please. Most of town expenditures are non-discretionary, which means we are contractually obligated to commit funding or we are legally obligated to pay out borrowed funds. 2% of the total budget represents discretionary uh, spending by town departments. Next slide, please. If we remove school funding and account for only the municipal side of the budget, the discretionary percentage is slightly more 2.18%, but this is a slightly bigger wedge in a smaller pie. Next slide, please. For this budget, we are projecting the following collection rates, 97.35% for residential, commercial, and tangible taxes, and 93.3% for motor vehicle. The total tax levy is projected to be about $57.7 million. Next slide. To put the proposed tax rate or the anticipated tax rate into perspective relative to inflation, over 20 years, the tax on a median value single, value, single family home has increased $1,703. If we account for inflation, that's $253, or $12.67 per year since, 20, uh, since the year 2000. Next slide, please. This slide represents a comparison of our current year tax burden relative to the rest of Rhode Island. In our current year, our tax rate is 24th lowest out of 39 cities and towns. Next slide, please. This slide represents where we rank compared to other cities and towns with like services, i.e. it's a town that offers a K through 12 school district, a fully funded police department, and a professional municipal fire department. In this chart, we rank against like towns in the lowest five. Next slide, please. The proposed plan includes funding for list for the capital requests and projects as listed. Of note, we will address needed town hall upgrades, equipment and vehicle replacement, phase three remediation of the Melville Dam, replacement of the Sandpoint Dock, an engineering study for the refurbishment of the Weaver Cove boat ramp, repairs to the Linden Lane, boat, Linden Lane stone wall, and rehabilitation projects in the fire department building. Next slide, please. So in closing, I'd like to reiterate that the budget is the most important short-term planning tool at our disposal. It is a plan wherein we establish service priorities for the community, and a method to continue providing those services in a fiscally sustainable way. I deeply appreciate the hard work of the most diligent staff. They are truly committed to excellence in government, and I am very proud of all of them. Lastly, I want to extend a heartfelt thank you to the school administration committee, the town committees who dedicate their time and service to our community, civic leaders for their valuable input and insight, and the department heads who deserve so much more than we can give. Mr. President, that concludes my presentation. Thank you, Mr. Rainer. Um, and we will, as you mentioned earlier, we will be getting into a lot more detail over the next uh, two or three nights. Um, and at this point, uh, do we have any uh, comments from our, uh, I, I do see some hands up, but anything from our counselors at the moment? Hey, Mr. President, this is Keith Hamilton. Um, Mr. Rayner, we discussed this a couple of years back uh, when we started doing the $50,000 for uh, the payoff of the 2012-13 um, warrant items. And you've plugged in the $50,000 coming out of the surplus from this, from last year, excuse me. Um, I would like to see, and we had, we had discussed it in the past, rather than earmarking that same $50,000 every year, which is going to take us roughly 40 years, excuse me, and, one point it's one point eight one point seven million dollars right now. So at fifty thousand dollars a year, it's going to take us uh, many years in order to pay that down. I would rather see us as a council earmark twenty five percent of each of the audited surplus to go to that, rather than using operating funds on a year to year basis. That would hopefully free up some money uh, in terms of budgets going forward, and hopefully also if we have large enough 
surpluses, we can utilize those surpluses to pay it down faster. I don't know if that's an appropriate motion to make now or if we want to do it later when we talk about um, these plans on either tomorrow night or Wednesday night. Um, so that's actually a very good point. I, I do remember us having some of these discussions um, when this came up about the how to pay off the warrant. And, you know, we have had surpluses. Um, it, it would seem reasonable that, you know, to, to have a, a percentage base um, would give us a little bit more flexibility in an event like this year. Um, you know, we, we would be able to pay off a lot more of it, but we're locked in at the 50, um, you know, for, for this, this current audit season. But, uh, I mean, I, I, I think that is a, an excellent point. I, I mean, whether we address it now or through the budget process, I think it's, it's definitely something that we should be considering. Um, Dr. Ryan? Yeah, I, I think, you know, deciding uh, on how to pay off the 2012-2013 warrant uh, should probably be a part of our overall discussion of the budget. I mean, one thing about the warrant is that it's a debt that we owe to ourselves and the money is not accruing interest. So whether we pay it off now, next year, the year after, the town is does not become more in debt by delaying it. So um, given the uncertainties uh, in our financing as a result of the current pandemic, uh, why don't we get further into the budget uh, and, and see what we're spending our money on before we decide uh, how to allocate a potential surplus this year? That's just my thought. It, Mark, it would be more of um, a plan going forward for the long term. It wouldn't be actually, yeah. it wouldn't be allocating money. It actually would be, if there was a surplus at the end of this year in June, it would be 25% of that surplus. Um, so we would still have, so let's just, let's say we have a $400,000 surplus to use nice round numbers, 20, 100,000 of that would go to pay it down and it'd still be $300,000 of money to either plug holes or go into the fund balance. Mr. President, if I may, Len Katzman. Yes, Mr. Katzman. Uh, I think it's a very interesting topic. Uh, it has come up before. Uh, there's certainly merit to paying down debt I am sensitive though to the town administrator's idea of having an emergency fund and there's a certain degree of uh, uncertainty right now, but specifically as to doing something tonight, I'm not comfortable that our agenda a presentation and submission for review of a budget brief um, is an appropriate announcement for the public for us to be making decisions and votes on, on uh, how we may encumber funds going forward. And, and that's fine. We can do this. On, like I said, I don't know if it's appropriate tomorrow night or Wednesday night <laughs> or God forbid Thursday night. <laughs> 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 but that's fine. It's just, you know, I just wanted to bring it up kind of so everybody can think about it that again, it's that right, nice round number. You got $400,000 as a surplus, 100,000 goes to pay it down rather than us earmarking that 50,000 every year in the budget. Um, even for next year, because next year that fifty thousand dollars is going to coming out of the surplus. So technically, next year, if we're going to put that hundred that fifty thousand dollars in, it's actually a hundred thousand dollar increase because it's not coming from money that's already in the budget. So that would be my other reason for going to that twenty five thousand, which would mean the twenty five percent of surplus each year, rather than earmarking that fifty. I tried 50% a couple of years ago, and well, we would have paid a lot of that down over the past five years, but, or well, four years. Mr. President, I have a question. This is Linda Ujifuza okay. for the town administrator. Can we go back to the slide where you're showing the um, division of how the surplus will be used? Or you, what you're proposing? That surplus slide, scroll up. Right. There, that one with the chart in the middle. There you go. Oh, it's actually, it's on, it's on screen, it's pretty good. Right, so yeah. what, but what you're proposing for the, oh. <laughs> Oops. Hold that photo. Hold on. Okay. 
there you go. There we go. So the emergency fund um, portion that you're recommending, um, if there is no call to use it uh, over the course of the next year, where would the where would those funds go? Would they just be swept back to the general fund? Yeah, you would have two options. I mean, you could continue this as a special fund, um, and I'll explain why in a second, uh, or you could sweep it into the fund balance. When we looked at the uh, I mean, we, we were done with this budget uh, really before COVID and then COVID came. Um, so we looked at what happened in the last comparable crisis. And obviously the nearest comparable crisis that had a financial impact on enforcement was the housing crisis and, and the, the bank banking crisis. And if you look at when Lehman Brothers went bankrupt and, and you know, the proverbial uh, you know, stuff hit the fan, uh, September 2008, uh, we still maintained about a 97% collection rate until 2010. So that's why I said, I don't think, we're obviously going to see a decrease in revenues, Glen Manor House, possibly the campgrounds, maybe the recreation, but those revenues are very small compared to the entire budget. I don't think we're going to hit, if we do, the decrease in collection rates until the next budget, not this fiscal year, but when, this time next year, I think we'll, we'll have greater fidelity in what the economic impact of COVID is on our economy. And we're going to have uh, a better uh, feel for how those impacts are going to impact enforcement. And then, uh, we would be able to have a coaching discussion on should we, if we haven't used that emergency fund, should we hold that over uh, for the following year or sweep it into the fund balance uh, because at that point we'll have adjusted our expenditures and revenues to be more in line with the, the fiscal realities. Uh, but it's, it's just so difficult to predict right now. I will say, I mean, I am on two conference calls a day with every single town administrator, town manager, and mayor in Rhode Island. We can, I can honestly say that Portsmouth is probably in, uh, in the top tier of preparedness and ability to absorb this. What would normally be considered an Achilles heel uh, for, for town finances, i.e. Our, our over dependence uh, in some people's minds on property taxes, um, it's actually a strength uh, right now because uh, most escrows have been funded. Most people are going to do everything they can to maintain um, their homes and be able to continue funding them and paying their taxes. So we are not as hit. The other thing that we don't have to uh, contend with right now uh, are things like referendums and uh, open, uh, you know, uh, huge town meetings, uh, which are really just impractical uh, right now. So many towns in Rhode Island are going to have, uh, have a big decision to make over the next couple of weeks on how, you know, are they going to go back to the drawing board? Uh, and are they not going to have a budget by June 30th? Uh, I just don't know the answer to that. Uh, I'm concentrated on enforcement, and I think that we're in good shape. So a long answer to your question. Uh, I just don't know what the answer is, but you'll be you'll be better prepared to make that decision this time next year. And, and what you were thinking about in terms of what would constitute emergency since it was pre-COVID was also the idea of hurricanes, I guess, and that and other emergencies that might arise. Is that true? Well, normally, uh, not quite. Uh, this fund I'm proposing to set up, this would be to offset the, any uh, missed revenue projections uh, so that we would avoid having to either uh, go back for a supplemental uh, levy uh, increase or come to the council uh, repeatedly to try to rob Peter and pay Paul in our own budget uh, to make it to the end of the year. Um, generally for things, those other events like hurricanes, uh, earthquakes, acts of God, that's what the fund balance is for. Uh, that's the rainy day fund. 
And that's what my comment was. Many, many communities are gonna be forced to dip into their rainy day funds. Uh, they're gonna do everything they can to prevent it, uh, but some are just gonna, it's gonna be unavoidable. Uh, for instance, I, I mean, just two towns away from us, Newport has already had a special meeting where they had to reduce their expenditures uh, this current fiscal year by over a million dollars because they, they received so much of their revenue from the tourist trade. We're not in that situation. Uh, as I reported tonight, we were ahead of our revenue projections and we're already two months into COVID. Um, so I think that we're, we're in good shape. And, and the answer to that question really is that this emergency fund would be separate from the fund balance. I'm trying not to touch the fund balance and set up something that will be able to plus up drops in revenue uh, in the next year. So we don't see a bathtub effect uh, uh, throughout the next fiscal year. We can keep it a, a very even keel approach to our fiscal, uh, you know, our finances. And as this plays out over the next year, we'll be in much better shape next year to kind of uh, forecast and anticipate uh, what the effects are going to be in, in fiscal year 22. Okay, thank you. Any more comments from counselors? I, I do know we have some folks on hold that, that have some comments. Um, so can we go to Mr. Fitzlawrence? I believe it's the first one. It might be the only one, but I see a hand. Other one. Mr. Fitzmaurice, can you hear us? You're muted. muted. He is muted. Muted. Um, would it be star six? It should be. Oh, he's unmuted. Hear me now. We got there you. Girl. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I just want to ensure you know I have an opportunity tomorrow night to not ask a number of questions relative to revenue and uh, some related issues. I understand that we're going to do revenue tomorrow, is that correct? We, tomorrow night we are going to have our uh, revenue discussion on the town and school and town and school expenditures, correct? Okay, I'll wait for tomorrow night. Thank you. Mrs. Fitzmarsh, Jeff, thank you for the call in. Your, your phone was awful staticky, so I don't know if it's a cell phone, landline. It was awful staticky. Um, no, this is a laptop. Laptop, okay. All right. Um, okay. Move it a little closer, but not now. <laughs> this makes the static louder. Mr. Roberts is our witness. <laughs> it's static. -y. Okay. Um, I don't see. Are there any other? I don't see any other callers. Any other? I see a lot of callers. I don't see any other hands. Okay. Anything from our counselors? No. Can I just I don't want to adjourn without just once again thanking the staff for for not only dealing with the COVID crisis but trying to continue doing the everyday work of preparing this budget. Um, it's just been amazing to watch the enormous amount of work that's gone into um, dealing with COVID and also this budget and and getting. Um, it prepare and I just want to say I'm so grateful and um, I encourage uh, people watching to go to PortsmouthRI.com and look at the daily the daily situation reports that are posted um, and prepared by our staff they're super informative super well organized and um, again thank you so much it's just been a, an amazing thing to watch thank you okay Anything else from our counselors? Um, if not, we've got uh, our our next topic is uh, correspondence. So we do have some correspondence. Motion to receive and place on file. Seconded. Seconded. Dr. Ryan, second. All those in favor? Mrs. Jacuzza? Aye. Ms. Abbott? Aye. Mr. Hamilton? Aye. Mr. Katzman? Aye. Mr. Kelly? Aye. Dr. Ryan? Aye. Mr. Aguilar? Aye. Motion passes 7 to 0. Uh, as we've already highlighted a few times, future meetings. Uh, we'll be right back here again uh, tomorrow night for our budget discussions on uh, revenue and town and school expenditures. Then it'll be on Wednesday night, the 22nd. Um, <laughs>
continuation of budget discussions and if necessary on Thursday night, April 23rd, um, we'll continue with budget discussions if needed. Uh, and then our next future meeting would be on May 11th. Um, would be our council meeting and, and provisional budget. So that's all for future meetings. Uh, Mr. President, I make a motion we adjourn. Second. That was Mr. Kelly and seconded by Mr. Hamilton. All those in favor? Ms. Ujituza? Aye. Ms. Abbott? Aye. Mr. Hamilton? Aye. Mr. Katzen? Aye. Mr. Kelly? Aye. Dr. Ryan? Aye. And Ms. Aguilar? Aye. Motion passes 7 to 0. Thank you all uh, for your participation and, uh, and support as we continue to try to uh, get through these, these hearings remotely. I know it's, um, it's, it's a different uh, format, but um, we're, we're doing our best and I, I appreciate everybody's support and, and patience as we, as we go through the process. Um, I, I'm glad we were able to <clears throat> some comments in tonight. So it is important that our viewers are able to to um, access us, raise their hands, and, and we can acknowledge them. So I'm glad to see that uh, the, the system is working. So thank you all for your participation, and uh, we'll see you tomorrow night. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Oh. All right. All right. That was excellent. That was she was great. She was awesome. That was like, that was unbelievable. Yeah, I mean, I'm amazed. Like I swear she had her notes.